Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Holly Pinero Jr. I am currently an assistant professor at Augusta University, and um, I'm doing the first of hopefully many um, interviews with authors uh, on some exceptional books related to the African American experience during the Civil War era. And uh, the first is going to be with. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna first show the book because I think this is important. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Tyler Perry. He was born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada. He obtained his bachelor's in history at uh, U University of Nevada, Las Vegas in 2008. After graduating UNLV, he completed his PhD in history at the University of South Carolina in tw uh, 2014. He is currently an assistant professor of African-American and African diaspora studies uh, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His research examines slavery, the African diaspora, and the historical memory of slavery in the United States. Uh, Dr. Perry is the author of Jumping the Broom, The Surprising Multicultural Origins of a Black Wedding Ritual that was published by the University of North Carolina Press in November of 2020. And that is really the centerpiece of this conversation um, because I loved it. So I figured I would love to, to talk with the author about it and also to raise more awareness about this important scholarship. His work uh, appears in various peer-reviewed academic journals and popular magazines, but also newspapers, including the Journal of African American History, American Studies, The Washington Post, Jacobin, and many others. Additionally, he serves as the senior editor of the award-winning blog, Black Perspectives, and is the vice president of the African American Intellectual History Society. And as I just learned, he is also uh, has a new project forthcoming uh, with Dr. Robert Green uh, that is a co-edited volume with the University of South Carolina Press that examines the experiences of African Americans on the campus grounds at USC in South Carolina from slavery through the present. And I'm really looking forward to that as well. So we'll probably be seeing him again real soon. So firstly, thank you for coming. And again, I just for those who have not seen or read, here is the book cover. It's I loved it. As soon as I saw that it was being released, it was a must not only read, but honestly a must cite for my work, which looks at Northern African American USCT soldiers and their families. So, I mean, for me, it was, you really pushed me to think and reconsider the marriage aspect. Um, so thank you. No, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Quite, quite humbled you invited me and uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a number of weeks now. All right. So let's uh, go ahead and just dive right in um, to some questions about, I mean, how you did the research really, because that was a question I kept asking myself as I was reading it. Uh, so what archives did you use for this project? What challenges did you experience while conducting the research? Yeah, so this research, I guess, was a little unconventional for a historian simply because when we think of historical archival work, we think of sitting at a desk in an old library, um, acquiring you know different old papers that you sift through and there was some of that for right. this project but if we expand what we mean by archive what i was looking at were really some old accounts by folklorists in the early 20th century who were jotting down their essentially field notes about different communities that they were visiting within the early 20th century and really writing about a practice that many of them didn't quite understand to some degree. I mean, so as far as a formal archive, uh, there was certainly some research conducted in Virginia, yeah. um, various archives around that particular area, Maryland, Virginia, Washington, DC, which are, are listed in the bibliography. But one thing I also found very, very valuable is the aspect of digital humanities and how important it is of the digitizing archival spaces, um, specifically because in, in one particular story that may be of interest to grad students who are thinking about beginning their research on their projects is that you can never take anything for granted as far as things being open. Yes. Now, this might seem more obvious to people now because of the pandemic, but for me, even when I was doing my, ar my archival research or looking to look at collections, there were also natural disasters on the Gulf Coast that actually impacted the way in which I could or could not access different archives. And so in the bibliography, there's a reference to Southern University, which is in Louisiana. 
And for a very long time after the hurricanes that were occurring there, their archives were essentially closed or they were damaged or they were trying to digitize different collections, but they were being slowed down by the natural disasters. So they were essentially off limits and kind of this limbo space to where I couldn't see them either in person or digitally. So I actually had to wait years, years and years before I could actually see them. And this is just sheerly good timing. I saw, and this is so maybe this is a way to understand research in the 21st century now. I saw a post from a friend who had no idea I was doing this project that had noted that a collection of narratives from formerly enslaved people conducted by John B. Kay that was housed at Southern University had now been digitized. This was a few years ago. And I was thinking, that's the collection I've been trying to see for five years at this point. And so I'm like, well, I'm writing the Jumping the Broom, broom book now. So let's go see what I can find. And so lo and behold, you know, that, that digital archive is now available to me right when I was finishing the book. And so I was able to include uh, that data set, which is very important for determining kind of the prominence of Jumping the Broom within a specific collection of research conducted in the early 20th century. But then also uh, I was able to access Margaret Walker's papers from Jackson State University. And so for me, it really helped me comprehend the important work that a number of my colleagues were doing in graduate school that I didn't quite understand at the time of really digitizing a number of these archives, both for preservation purposes, but also just so they're accessible to the broader body politic because we never know what's going to happen. But I mean, beyond just this kind of traditional understanding of archives, um, you know, I was just reading old volumes that, you know, people may or may not have heard of throughout this entire prospect. And, you know, there are some works that have been digitized and were word searchable, but then others weren't. So one of the things that I did that I think was maybe unique is I, I acquired or I accessed this um, multi-volume collection called The American Slave, a composite autobiography, which is very noteworthy amongst most scholars of American slavery, but only part of those have been digitized and placed upon the National Archives website. And so me trying to develop kind of this sample of data to where I could quantify whether or not the broomstick wedding was prominent within the narratives of formerly enslaved people. I just decided to do this old school, sit down, read through all of the volumes at a desk and note where I saw or didn't see jump in the broom reference within marriage ceremonies of enslaved people. Right. And, you know, I, I certainly um, advocate for that within any scholar because there really is no experience quite like just diving into a single set of sources for an extended period of time. It might take you longer to finish the project, but I mean, for me, that was a really, really important component of the research that I did. But all of this to say, um, when doing even this Atlantic work or transnational work, I was always cognizant of trying to draw comparisons within what I found in different areas. So if I saw a description of the broomstick wedding mentioned by a formerly enslaved person that was similar to something that, you know, a Romani person was doing within the British Isles, right. that way I could kind of connect these two kind of disparate sources, people who had no, no idea the other existed and say that there's a commonality here in framing this, even if I don't have a direct connection right. between it goes from one area of the Atlantic to the other. I mean, sometimes scholars find these gems where <laughs> they find a single person Right. who writes about their experience the entire time. I broadly didn't have that. So in order to make an Atlantic claim of how the broomstick wedding was influencing, particularly the North Atlantic uh, cultural communities, um, I had to essentially draw these comparisons between the ways people were uh, describing the process similarly or differently, and then doing what I could with that as I was forming some of my conclusions. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, first off, you're highlighting the the adaptability of scholars, right? The traditional sense, right, of the archival, like getting in there, but also the, you know, the having the accessibility, also the affordability for many people of having stuff digitized and not having to travel 
or you know to to navigate that difficulty especially now uh, i think it's great that you're you're using the best of both worlds in some ways um, but actually the the point you just raised hits on to the next question which to me was something that really i'll be honest challenged what i thought initially of of, of the the the, uh, of the enslaved marriage dynamics and in some ways how this even kicks over to the freed experience, um, which for me was that's what pulled me as soon as I saw this was even going to be released. I was like, I have to read this. Um, so my next question uh, is, how does this book, as you point out, it spans long periods of time, which I think is phenomenal and you do an exceptional job of. And as you point out, diverse groups of people, um, diverse uh, ethnic, religious, racial dynamics and spaces. How would you say that this book uh, is is an important addition to Civil War era scholarship? Um, because I think this is, I saw it myself, but I would love to get your perspective as you wrote it, as you were conceptualizing it, giving it what you said, but even drawing these connections. Yeah, this is a great question and, and very multi-layered on my part, because I guess here's one thing the book is not for those who are listening and even thinking about you know reading it. It is not a description of battles. It doesn't even really talk about specific soldiers or groups. I leave that to the the experts right. of the Civil War era. But one thing that the book does, um, as far as delving into the Civil War era concept, is that there are a few periods in history that have specific relevance for understanding why the broomstick wedding appears and why it disappears. Now. The first, what you could call casualty of, you know, jumping the broom as far as the Civil War is concerned, is that that is the event that will cause the seismic shift as to how people of African descent are going to wed one another. So obviously in the antebellum period, what you find is that a number of people jumped over the broomstick in a variety of ways, which I, I go at some great lengths to describe, um, you know, class dimensions, gender dimensions and whatnot, which we can certainly get to a little bit later. Um, but at the Civil War, one thing that I actually found kind of interesting is when we think about the Civil War and living through that particular conflict, I was always fascinated at how many people were just living their lives still. Now, yes. obvious, obviously, <laughs> they knew that something was going on right. and that it was getting closer to them. But I found at least more than a few people who said, yeah, we just jumped the broom while the Civil War was going on. So they were actually still you know, engaging in these cultural rituals, right. despite the fact that you know, the next day it could be declared over and they right. could be declared free potentially. So I found that actually really interesting as far as engaging kind of this ground level lived experience of people who are surrounded by, you know, maybe cannon flare or gunshots or boats going in and out um, and, you know, potentially having to hide from soldiers when they, when they come to an individual plantation. But right at about 1865, uh, when the, the Civil War ends, particularly by 1866, um, I didn't find a lot of continuity. Now, there were some individual cases where people would claim that within their particular community, they continued to jump the broom. And a lot of that had to do with they were just too rural. There weren't many churches around. Ministers may or may not come through the community. And in many ways, for formerly enslaved people, that mirrors exactly the approach that Euro-American communities were taking and that they were so rural, they were so remote that it was never a guarantee if a minister came through town to actually uh, wedge you in a, in a formal legal right. way. Now, but beyond that, what does seem to occur is that African-American couples, newly freed, are making some determinations as to how they want to continue their uh, lives as domestic partners. And a number of people have written very good books about the complications that come with freedom in this regard. But for me, what I found most interesting was there was now a decision to be made. Do we register our marriage? Do we formalize it, so-called? with you know, a government that came down from the North and is telling us this is the best thing we can do for ourselves to be good citizens of the, of the Republic? Or do we just believe that what we did under slavery was as good as anything else the government can provide for us? And you know, at least a few people mentioned this uh, aspect of money, like this idea that you had to pay to be recognized as wedded. Right. 
um, which they very much resented, um, saying that, you know, I jumped the broom and that was fine. My community said it was good and we live happily. Um, exactly. Whereas, and then they would, they would even get in these generational disagreements and say, all of these young kids listening to jazz, going to all these clubs, they don't care about marriage. But back in my day, we right. actually took the community seriously. So I found that even really fascinating as to the amount of detail that people actually went to, to talk about this. But it is, it is that civil war event, that period of four to five years where there are some significant adjustments, but by the time the war had concluded, I mean, you really have to look at people's worlds just completely changing. Yes. Um, now, yes. all because all of a sudden you have you know the Freedmen's Bureau coming down and telling people what they do need to do, what they can or what they can't do, and so even within that, we I think a number of people who might not be experts in the Civil War or that era don't fully appreciate how significant structurally the changes were for individuals. And so alongside that is this question of, do we continue these folk rituals that are associated with slavery? And so by that point, the discussion becomes, some people are actually trying to actively suppress any memory of the broomstick ritual as it had existed prior to the war. Because for them, they interpret integration into the American body politic as leaving behind this era of slavery and everything associated with it. And if you were willing to actually talk about slavery, you formed this narrative of how your individual enslaver you know, prepared you to learn how to read or that they were nice to you or they were better than other enslavers across the plantations. And so some people actually made this attempt to say, you know, my master was good, but the neighboring plantation, you should have seen how he treated his enslaved people. And, you know, there's a lot of coded language within that. They may or may not have actually been talking about their own experience, but in the context of being interviewed under Jim Crow, you are going to be very careful with the message that you convey because you still very much fear for your safety within that environment, especially if your interviewer is white. And so another piece of this, maybe to even gel with the first question, is a lot of this was reading between the lines, um, what was really being conveyed here, and the degree to which one can assess whether or not jumping the broom becomes less important. So even if it was suppressed physically, like people didn't do it as often, it was still very much embedded in the colloquialisms that people use. So I found evidence that people continue to, you know, make jumping the broom synonymous with just getting married, maybe in more uh, informal or less formal fashion. And so all of this to say is that the first major event, particularly when talking about the United States, is the Civil War era because that sets up the first major suppression of jumping the broom for about a hundred years until it's revived during really the next um, significant event, which I would argue is the Civil Rights Movement, the rise of Black Power, and then ultimately Alex Haley's uh, novel. Which we will get to. Um, I just wanted to also bring up, I mean, for me, it's like you, and you talk about this isn't the tactical traditional, right? That some people, love about civil war which is great but yours i see it as you're talking about the tactics of black marriage Mm -hmm. right like as you talk about the ways in which they're navigating they're making conscious decisions or not speaking in certain ways about it i mean that is an important framing that i think it does perfectly fit and continues as you're saying long after the war has ended Um, even when you talked about the you know i hear some of that politics of respectability and how it's being discussed in a racial and class sense it makes me think of Susie King Taylor's memoirs. And she makes that point towards the end of her memoir about talking about the young women in her community, which to me was not what I expected when reading for her experiences during the war. And she talks about her post-war family struggles. And then there's this important point she makes, uh, which I believe connects. So, I mean, to me, this is an exceptional study that is is in conversation with the Volia Glimpse work, with Amy Morell Taylor's work, with Brandy uh, Brandy Clay Brimmer's exceptional new book that just came out, Claiming Union Widowhood, I believe is the title. Hopefully, I'll have her on soon. This is part of that conversation, uh, which I think is important that you highlight. 
Well, I have to say, I mean, I'm honored to be listed amongst those names. Uh, this, this, that's fantastic. And I certainly appreciate it. And, you know, I guess to keep this last comment brief to touch upon what you say is that I think the unfortunate consequence within the broader public conception of Civil War history is that you're talking about generals and the great men histories and things like that. And th there's nothing entirely wrong with writing biographical sketches of significant people or those who were declared to be significant. But the thing that always interested me most, particularly when I started studying slavery in general, but specifically engaging in the Civil War period, is the kind of ground level experiences of people making decisions like this human history of the Civil War and trying to find the ways in which people were negotiating their position under very fraught circumstances. And so I came out with a great deal of admiration for people for how honest they were being and how they were navigating their own position within a landscape that is actually hard for many of us to imagine at that point. Right. So I appreciate that you noticed that about that particular section. Yeah, I think, uh, I think this is exceptional and we're gonna take a quick break and we'll go ahead and resume.